Sophie put on a summer dress and hurried down to the kitchen. Her mother was standing by the kitchen table. Sophie decided not to say anything about the silk scarf. Did you bring in the newspaper? She said. Her mother turned. Would you get it for me? Sophie was out of the door in a flash, down the gravel path to the mailbox. Only the newspaper. She couldn't expect an answer so soon. She supposed on the front page of the paper, she read something about the Norwegian UN battalion in Lebanon. The UN battalion wasn't that the postmark on the card from Hilda's father, but the postage stamp had been Norwegian. Maybe the Norwegian UN soldiers had their own post office with them. You've become very interested in the newspaper. Luckily, her mother said no more about mailboxes and stuff, either during breakfast or later on that day. When she went shopping, Sophie took her litter about fate down to the den. She was surprised to see a little white envelope beside the cookie tin with other letters from the philosopher. Sophie was quite sure she had not put it there. This envelope was also wet around the edges and it had a couple of deep holes in it, just like just like the one she had received yesterday. Had the philosopher been here? Did he know about her secret hiding place? Why was the envelope wet? All these questions made her head spin. She opened the letter and read the note. Dear Sophie, I read your letter with great interest and not without some regret. I must unfortunately disappoint you with regard to the invitation. We shall meet one day, but it will probably be quite a while before I can come in person to Captain's bed. I must add that from now on I will no longer be able to deliver the letters personally. It would be much risky in the long run. In the future, letters will be delivered by my little messenger. On the other hand, they will be brought directly to the secret place in the garden. You may continue to contact me whenever you feel the need. When you do, Put a pink envelope out with a cookie or a lump of sugar in it. When the messenger finds it, he will bring it straight to me. It is not pleasant to decline a young lady's invitation to coffee, but sometimes it is a matter of necessity. PPS. If you should come across a red silk scarf anywhere, please take care of it. Sometimes personally property gets mixed up. Sometimes personally, sometimes personal property gets messed up at least at Christmas and on birthdays. But this letter was the strangest one she had ever received. It had no postage stamp. It hadn't even been put in the mailbox. It had been brought straight to Sophie's top secret hideout in the old hedge. The fact that that was it and this other pupil had lost a red silk scarf, right? But how? But how had he managed to lose it under Sophie's bed? And Alberto Knox, what kind of a name was that? One thing was confirmed, the connection between the philosopher and Hilda Muller Nag, but that Hilda's own father was now confusing their addresses. That was completely incomprehensible. Sophie sat for a long time thinking about what connection there could possibly be between Hilda and herself. Finally, she gave up. The philosopher had written that she would meet him one day. Perhaps she would meet Hilda too. She turned the letter over. She now saw that there were some sentences written on the back as well. Is there such a thing as natural modesty? Wisest is she who knows she does not know. True insight comes from within. He who knows what is right will do right. So if he knew that the short sentences that came in the white envelope were intended to prepare her for the next big envelope, which would arrive shortly thereafter. She suddenly had an idea. If the messenger came to the den to deliver a brown envelope, Sophie could simply sit and wait for him. Or was it a her? She would definitely hang on to she would definitely hang on to whoever it was until he or she told her more about the philosopher. The letter said that the messenger was little. Could it be a child? Is there such a thing as natural modesty? Sophie knew that modesty was an old-fashioned word for shyness. For example, 
about being seen naked, but it was really natural to be embarrassed about that. If something natural, she supposed, it was the same for everybody. In many parts of the world, it was completely natural to be naked. So it must be society that decides what you can and can't do. When grandpa, when grandpa was young, you certainly couldn't sunbathe topless. But today, most people think it is natural, even though it is still strictly forbidden in lots of countries. Was this philosophy? Sophie wondered. The next sentence was, wisest is she who knows she does not know. Wiser than who? If the philosopher meant that someone who realized that she doesn't know everything under the sun was wiser than someone who knew just a little, but who thought she knew a lot, well, that wasn't difficult to agree with. Sophie had never thought about it before. The more clear, the more clear, but the more she did, the more clearly she saw that knowing what you don't know is also a kind of knowledge. The stupid, the stupidest. The stupidest thing she knew was for people to act like they know all about things they knew absolutely nothing about. The next sentence was about true insight coming from within. But didn't all knowledge come into people's head from the outside? Sophie. On the other hand, Sophie could remember situations when her mother or the teacher at school had tried to teach her something that she hadn't been receptive to. And whenever she had really learned something, it was when she had somehow contributed to it herself. Now and then, even, she would suddenly understand a thing she'd drawn a total blank on before. That was probably what people meant by insight. So far, so good. Sophie thought she had done, Sophie thought she had done reasonably well on the first three questions. But the next statement was so odd, she couldn't help smiling. He who knows what is right will do right. Did that mean that when a bank robber robbed a bank, it was because he didn't know any better? Sophie did not think so. On the contrary, she thought that both children and adults did stupid things that they probably regretted afterwards. Precisely because they had done them, precisely because they had done them against their better judgment. While she had sat thinking, she heard something rustling. She heard something rustling in the dry undergrowth on the other side of the hedge nearest the wood. Would it be the messenger? Her heart started beating faster. It sounded like a panting animal was coming. The next moment, a big Labrador pushed its way into the den. In its mouth, it held a big brown envelope, which it dropped at Sophie's feet. It all happened so quickly that Sophie had no time to react. A second later, she was sitting with the big envelope in her hands, and the golden Labrador had scampered off into the woods again. Once it was all over, she reacted. She started to cry. She sat like that for a while, losing all sense of time. Then she looked up suddenly, so that, so that was the famous messenger? Sophie breathed a sigh of relief. Of course that was, of course that was why the white envelope were wet around the edges and had holes in them. Why hadn't she thought of it? Now it made sense to put a cookie or a lump of sugar in the envelope when she wrote to the philosopher. She may not always have been as smart as she would like, but who, but who could have guessed that the messenger was a trained dog? It was a bit of the ordinary. To put it mildly, she could certainly forget all about forcing the messenger to reveal Alberto Knox. Whereabouts? Sophie opened the big envelope and began to read. The Philosophy of Athens. Dear Sophie, dear Sophie, when you read this, you may already have met Hermes. In case you haven't, I'll add that he is a dog. But don't worry. He's very good tempered and moreover a good deal more intelligent than a lot of people. In any event, he never tries to give the impression of being clever. You may also note that his name is not without significance. In Greek mythology, Hermes was the messenger of the gods. He was also the god of seafarers. But we shall not bother about that, at least not for the moment. It is more important that Hermes also gave his name to the word Hermetic, which means hidden 
or inaccessible, not appropriate for the way Hermes takes care to keep the two of us hidden from each other. So, th so the messenger has herewith been introduced. Naturally, he answers to his name and is altogether very well behaved. But to return to philosophy, we had already completed the first part of the course. Philosophers. I refer to the natural philosophers and their decisive break with the, with the mythological word picture. Now we are going to meet the three great classical philosophers, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, each in his own way. These philosophers influenced the whole of European civilization. The natural philosophers are also called the pre-Socrates because they lived before Socrates, although Democrit Democritus, Democritus, Democritus. Although Democritus died some years after Socrates, all his ideas belong to pre-Socratic natural philosophy. So Socrates represents a new era, geographically as well as temporally. He was the first of the great philosophers to be born in Athens, and both he and his two successors lived and worked there. You may recall that Anaxagoras also lived in Athens for a while, but was hounded but was but was hounded out because he said the sun was a red hot stone socrates fared no better from the time of socrates athens was the center of greek culture it is also important to note the change of character in the philosophical project itself as it progresses from natural philosophy to socrates but before we meet socrates let us hear a little about the so-called Sophists, who dominated the Athenian scene at the time of Socrates. Curtain up, Sophie. The history of ideas is like a drama in many acts.